What does it mean to say that gender shapes our world? This is one of the things we explore in our gender and sexuality program, and I will give you a little taste of how we do so. And today, I will focus on gender. We are surrounded by commonsensical notions of gender, gender lenses through which we look at the world. Now, when we study gender, it is important that we unpack those commonsensical notions and develop an analytical approach to gender, gender as an analytical category. This has been done in different ways. And in our program, we find it important to cover at least a few of these different concepts of gender and to teach how to think with a concept of gender see what it allows you to see, but also become aware of its limits. And when it comes to concepts of gender, there are a few that we study in more detail in our program, and I will briefly take you through some of them. Social reproduction theory. Social reproductive labor attends to all the labor that makes productive work possible. That is to say, the labor that makes sure that the worker can do productive work which includes the labor of giving birth to the worker, but also of cooking, cleaning, raising children, the labor of making sure that the emotional, the health, and the sexual needs of the worker are attended to. Social reproductive theory shows us how deeply gendered, racialized, and classed this reproductive labor is. Who does the reproductive labor in our capitalist societies? And here we read authors such as Titi Bhattacharya, and Silvia Federici. If social reproduction theory is a materialist approach to gender, then sexual difference theory attends to what happens with gender or sexual difference within the realm of the symbolic. And the way in which the masculine is privileged within the construction of meaning in our cultures and within processes of subject formation that women as body, as matter, are cast as a reflexive mirror, as an imaginary support, but not as a subject of their own. What would it take for women to become a subject of their own? Here we read the important work of Luce Irigaré and Rosie Braidotti. A theory of performativity, elaborated by Judith Butler, and we also read José Muñoz, draws attention to the fact that gender is not a stable uh, identity from which acts proceed, but that the seemingly stable point of departure is in fact the result, the effect of a process of doing gender. It is the sedimentation of stylized repetition of acts over time that creates the seemingly appearance of substance. Now, this doing of gender is not the product of our free will, but it is shaped by norms, very often violent norms, by forceful scripts of binary gender within a heteronormative matrix of power. So how is gender done and undone constantly, and how can it be done differently are some of the questions that we ask here. There are many theories that one way or the other deal with the ways in which gender and sexuality are marked by colonial regimes of power and knowledge. And how this coloniality of gender, as Maria Lugones has called it, is an intricate dimension of our contemporary understandings of gender. This is in the aftermath of colonial regimes disciplining acceptable, civilized forms of gender and sexuality. And thereby eradicating or erasing various formations of genders, third genders, non-heteronormative sexualities. This coloniality or modernity of contemporary understandings of gender and sexuality has informed feminist and queer theory. And we read authors such as Sabah Mahmoud and Jasbir Puar who are key in unpacking some of these deep-rooted Eurocentrist uh, assumptions about gender and sexuality. Now, to make these different theoretical approaches more tangible, let me briefly apply these gender lenses to one object. And for the sake of time, I have chosen not a complicated empirical reality, 
about which I need to explain too much, but a cultural object, an artifact that many will be familiar with. The Handmaid's Tale, the novel by Margaret Atwood, and the Hulu series based on the novel. A social reproductive theory lens allows us to focus on the organization of reproductive labor in this dystopian society in which fertility rates have dropped drastically and children are the new gold. Reproductive labor is divided among the, or between the handmaids who bear children, the martas who do domestic work, the wives who raise children and who do the work of family and emotional support of the husbands, the Jezebels who provide sex without reproduction, and the aunts who discipline all of these women into reproducing the entire system. A sexual difference theory lens highlights the position of men and women within the symbolic order of the Republic of Gilead. Full subjectivity belongs to men in this society. They are the political rulers, the decision makers, they um, at large do all the productive work, they are subjects of sexual pleasure, and they are the subjects of knowledge. They are the only ones allowed to read. When the wife of one of the main commanders seeks to vindicate some rights for some women, the right to read for the wives, and she does so by reading from the Bible in front of the council of commanders, uh, she's punished by bodily mutilation. The lens of gender performativity allows us to see chapter after chapter or series after series how gender is done and disciplined. It shows the incredible amount of violence that is part of this becoming a certain gendered being and what happens to those who fail to conform to the gender traitors. Finally, the lenses of the coloniality of gender bring us to the Republic's colonies, where disposable lives are disposed of, while at the same time still having a reproductive function for the Republic through their forced labor. They work till they drop. It also brings us to the fantasies of replacement. In the epilogue of the novel, which is set at an academic conference in the future, we learn from one of the academic historical papers that in a context of environmental destruction and drop of fertility rates, it was the fear of replacement of the Caucasian population that led to the establishment of Gilead. And the Hulu series has been critiqued for making a post-racial story out of the novel instead of dealing with this racial war dynamic head-on. While this is a dystopian novel, there are many resonances with contemporary social uh, struggles over gender and sexuality. Struggles over the organization of reproduction and who holds the power and control over reproduction. Struggles against feminicide, which is a symptom of how women lack a full autonomous subject position, the entitlement, the male entitlement to just take her life away. Mobilizations against gender ideology and the rise of replacement conspiracies and the ways in which gender and sexuality are enlisted in these conspiracies. There is, of course, so much more to say about all of this. Different conceptualizations allow us to see different dimensions of these complex realities that we call gender. Realities that include many material and cultural and symbolic dimensions, and in which gender is always already about sexuality, about race, about class. So much more to explore here, and I invite you to come and explore with us.